Hi there, Reddit community. It's uh, John Popola here, and I'm going to answer some questions that you guys have posted under the Ask Me Anything thread. So this is my first time doing this. It's always a little weird talking into your computer alone, <laughs> but I'm going to try my best to answer your questions. Uh, so let's just dig right in. I'm going to just go right down the list here uh, and try to answer as many as I can. So first question. Is Paul Krugman misinformed or flat out dishonest? <sighs> well, there was a time when the answer was certainly no to both, I think. I mean, he was a good economist before the year 2000. Uh, I read his book, uh, The uh, Return of Depression Economics, which was for the most part a pretty good book. It was a celebration of free trade and, and uh, how you know, global free trade and global capitalism, so to speak, uh, lifts people's lives up and, and creates prosperity. Or, or should, should I say, you know, allows people to create prosperity. There's no creation that happens without people. Um, it does seem like he's become a demagogue, though. Uh, and I'm not sure why that transformation took place, but at this point, I don't think he's misinformed. He's too smart and he has too many resources at his disposal for being misinformed to be an, an acceptable uh, explanation for some of the things he asserts. But, you know, the recent, just a perfect example of where this question isn't just a, a sort of an attack on him is the, uh, the article he just wrote about so-called austerity that's happening in, the, in Britain and how that's causing their economy to underperform. And of course it's all about, you know, more Keynes, more spending. And, um, and he makes no distinction when he talks about spending as, as far as whether it's digging ditches or actual real investment and productive, uh, you know, capacity in some, in some sense. The problem, of course, is that there, there isn't any austerity in any sense that that word can be reasonably used. I mean, you know, uh, Scott Sumner had a post about Britain's deficit, and it's like the third largest in the West. It's like over 8% of GDP. Plus, I think, I'm pretty sure that the data on their actual total spending is that it has gone up each year since 2007. So, I just don't know how you call that austerity. I, I, I think there's just total, a tautological thing in his argument, since, of course, he makes no reference to any data. He doesn't say, you know, they've cut spending by X, or, you, you know, nominal d demand or nominal, what GDP has fallen by why. There's none of that. There's simply, the red, there's rhetoric about austerity, therefore there's austerity. And because there's unemployment, there must be austerity because austerity causes unemployment in his model, in his mind. So I would call that, uh, I would call, I, I, don't, I, I guess you have to call it dishonest. I don't see how you can say that spending cuts are happening when they're not. Of course, the, the biggest challenge for the question of whether Paul Krugman is dishonest or not is that the whole nature of this macroeconomic concept is so prone to confirmation bias that he, he can probably tease out some way in which it is, he, it's not a lie, not a technical lie, because there's no way to prove the truth. It's not falsifiable. So, um, that's like a get-out-of-jail-free card for saying whatever the heck you want uh, under the auspices of your government policy. Um, but, but again, I don't see how you can call the gigantic deficits austerity and year-over-year -year spending growth austerity. You know, austerity is hungry people in uh, the, the multi-billions in poverty going to sleep with an empty belly it's malnourishment, it's high rates of infant mortality, that's austerity. Austerity is not um, reducing retirement ages from, or I should say, I guess, <laughs> increasing retirement ages from 55 to 57, or, uh, you know, cutting back the goodies that, that the richest countries on earth um, are, are, are being given by their governments. That's not austerity. That the, the use of that word for those kinds of changes really is, in my opinion, pretty offensive. It's offensive to any notion of um, 
what's happening to human beings all around the world. And I think that the, it, that's, again, it's a demagogic approach, demagogic approach. All right, question number two. What is your take on the anarchist strain that has gained so much influence among current Austrians? Um, okay, so, so part of this question has an assertion in it that I don't know whether it's true or not, which is, has there been a large influence of philosophical anarchists, you know, anarcho-capitalism, anti-statism, in current Austrians? Uh, I, I can't say that's definitely true or not, but let's assume for a moment that it is true, and it certainly just sort of anecdotally, it seems like the young people that are excited about Ron Paul and excited about liberty that I've met and that I meet on Facebook and stuff like that seem to lean more anarchistic than than not. Um, I don't know. I think that a part of it is that the Mises Institute has been incredibly uh, effective in leveraging the web, leveraging the amount of content they produce, and um, and being out there, getting the message, their message out, and their message is a a, a Rothbardian, um, you know, anarcho-capitalist approach to uh, libertarianism and the, and the philosophy of liberty. I think, uh, you know, that's both good and bad in the sense that economics is not the same thing as libertarianism. They're not the same discipline. Um, they certainly can feed into each other in the sense that good e economics doesn't really seem to give a lot of room for government intervention, and so that, you know, it seems like if you learn good economics, it tends to make you pretty skeptical about the government. And, um, but good econom most economists are uh, consequentialists, which is to say they judge the outcome, um, or I guess, how do you put it, they, they, they basically, they, they judge whether a system or a set of rules or a, uh, or whatever, you know, whatever, I, I hate the word system because it, it makes it seem like something's been designed when it hasn't, but it's basically a set of rules, whether it's property rights or what we call capitalism or the free market, and they judge whether it's good or not based on the outcomes, based on the consequences, not based on a ethical or theoretical sort of framework that's rooted in some type of core belief. It's not, I believe that it's wrong for force to be used to achieve some objective, therefore X, Y, and Z follows from that, you know, a priori logic. That's, and that's me, that's, you know, the Rothbardian and the Misesian, I guess, um, methodology. So, you know, and, but, but Mises was not a, uh, a natural rights theorist like Rothbard, to my knowledge. I mean, my understanding is he was like a utilitarian thinker, so, so he was a consequentialist like Milton Friedman or Hayek. Um, you know, he argued that free markets and capitalism, again, he, he used capitalism. I, I, capitalism as a term is problematic for reasons that we can talk about, but uh, he, he used uh, a utilitarian approach, and his, his economics led to his, his thinking, it seems like. But I'm no, I'm no expert on Mises, or, you know, a lot, of, I'm no expert on anything, <laughs> so don't take my word for it. Um, anyway, back to the question. So, I mean, I think number one, the Mises Institute, which is a, fun, you know, fundamentally an anarcho, capitalist uh, um, organization, you know, has done a great job in outreach and and uh, and getting the message out, and of course they're, you know, a giant proponent of Austrian economics, again, in that Rothbardian tradition, that Rothbardian sort of system uh, framework for understanding the business cycle and the methodology of, of econ and liberty. And so that's been huge. I think also... And this is what I think is kind of interesting. Uh, it's the purity of it. So I think young people, I think the same thing that made socialism appealing is what makes 
uh, anarcho-capitalism appealing because it, it's tight I, um, logically. It all works as a, as a coherent vision for your, your perfect world. It is, it is, there's a utopian quality to it. And what I think so interesting about that is I just read Hayek's um, paper, uh, The Intellectuals and Socialism. Or maybe it's Socialism and the Intellectuals, I can't remember. <laughs> but in that piece, he makes a very interesting point that, cuts, that gets right at this. He says that, again, he, he actually says the success of uh, socialism as an idea is in part thanks to that, I think he calls it either boldness or courage, that courage to, to you know, put forward a radical, progressive idea. Progressive as in, you know, the sense of moving. This is how we're going to move society forward. This is going to how we're gener going to generate our utopia. And having a vision, a big vision, a big bold vision. And he's and his and his uh, point of view is that the you know the classical liberal tradition has really been rooted in a real world problem solving and and a, so it's not reactionary but a um, you know these things work these sets of institutions and rules you know lead to better outcomes for for society you know property rights the rule of law you know keeping government sort of bound by some type of something <laughs> anything um, and uh, and he actually puts forward in in that piece that the next the neck the missing piece for liberty the missing piece for liberals was a radical vision a radical essentially utopian vision the perfect system or the perfect ideal and I think Rothbard answered the call Rothbard from a natural natural rights standpoint and then David Friedman um, which is the book I haven't actually read yet, but I understand that David Friedman's work, The Machinery of Freedom, comes at a kind of a stateless society ideal from the opposite direction, in the sense that it's not based on natural rights, it's not based on that sort of John Locke tradition of, I own my body, therefore you can't hurt me, you can't, you know, commit violence against me, and then from that core ownership of myself flows everything else. It flows property value, property rights, because when I mix my labor with the land, I, you know, I, I, I come to own it, homesteading, and etc. Um, and so I think what's so, so, so neat, in a way, is that, you know, Hayek puts, puts the challenge forward, and whether Rothbard was fully aware of it or not, in terms of Hayek, um, Rothbard answers the challenge and puts that forward, and, and, and Hayek's prediction, in a way, that that's what we, that's what was necessary. That 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 you you need to have sort of a, a a white hot core for your for your philosophy for your movement um, seems to be proving true. And so I think that that blazing core of Rothbard, who's you know a firebrand and and and. Uh, um, you know, you, you don't mess with him. He's he doesn't mess around. He doesn't mess around with words. He doesn't uh, hold back. And I, I haven't read everything he's ever written. And I've heard that there's some things he's written that are uh, not not exactly things I would agree with. But he's a powerful writer and he's a powerful thinker. And that I think is why you have so many more excited young people saying that the state is an illegitimate entity. That's any form of state, anything that, that, that basically makes claim to sovereignty over an area without title in, a, in, the, in that, you know, property rights Lockean tradition, title to the property, say, you know, that any, anything that claims dominion over an area and, a, and becomes the sovereign is illegitimate, you know, and, and, and history shows there's a lot of that stuff, there's a lot of Genghis Khan style establishment, that seems to be the norm. Um, okay, next up. Who is best, Hayek, Mises, or Rothbard? Um, it, there is no best. Um, uh, that's so. So, who? The next question is: Who is the best, Hayek, Mises, or Rothbard? 
So I've actually read more Rothbard than Hayek, believe it or not, even though I made these videos with Russ about Hayek and versus Keynes. And um, I've actually read very little Mises. You know, I, I know of his approach by way of Rothbard and by way of having conversations with other people and reading sort of secondary references to Mises' approach and thought. So I can't really speak to Mises uh, directly. Um, I think that there's, as I said in the last long-winded answer, I think Rothbard lays out a bold, you know, sort of courageous vision. Courageous in the sense of he's swinging for the fences, and it's and it's an it's a utopian vision. Now, it's not utopian in the same way that socialism is utopian. You, socialism is is utopian in an, in a kind of naive way that's backed up by no experience of man of mankind it, it asserts that you're going to have this transformation into socialist man that man's nature is going to be transformed and that man's nature must be transformed in order for socialism to work and that is uh, that's that's a that's a leap that there's no reason to expect to have happen um, that leaps into uh, uh, like religion and, and, and some kind of spiritual, you know, transformation process. It's got, there's nothing in history that suggests that people are going to let go of their desire to live a better life and cease demanding so that we can end scarcity by way of ending demand for things, which is, so, so the socialist utopia is, is really very, is it very different than when I say that Rothbard's vision is utopian. Um, I think Rothbard's vision of, of is is utopian in the sense that it, it there hasn't really been a, a truly like an anarcho-capitalist society, and in, in, not in my knowledge, certainly nothing that's modern, certainly nothing that isn't basically more than you know medieval tribal society where you know yeah okay like uh, I've heard like medieval Iceland and places like that didn't really have a state so to speak. And so you had essentially community governance and this tribal governance and stuff like that. But that's not, you know, I like having technology. I like having global travel. I like having, you know, d global division of labor that enables us to ex enjoy the standard of living that, that we have and, and, the, and the, the standard of living that's spreading all around the world. And, and I'm, not, I'm not convinced yet that that can happen. Um, on the scale it is in a tribal type of scenario. So given that the only sort of things that could maybe be called like an anarchist or stateless have been small and tribal, that's not enough to say, well, this obviously is going to work and this is great. So to me, Rothbard lays out a, a philosophical benchmark, baseline. You know, this, you know, he says, look, he takes it all the way. If force is bad, if the government, if, if government force is coercion, then the, there's the you know the best government's not small. The best government is no government at all. Um, the downside for me of Rothbard is twofold. One is I think his tone is a little harsh, and I think that that's both that's good. You know, he's got that stridence that can be you know sort of exciting to read, and he's a, a good writer, and it, it's a fast read. But um, it's, it can be really off-putting, and I think that it's not, and, and I think that the stridence of it and the adherence to this sort of narrow, in, in my opinion, this narrow, and again, I'm saying this as somebody that's read, read three or four of his books and really liked them, but the narrowness of this a priori step from A to B, this, you know, um, essentially purely logical, Praxeological, so to speak, walk through. There's a there's a lack of texture of life, and there's a lack of of um, uh, there's a little bit of a hubris in it that I think is problematic. And Hayek really is to me the one that fills that out, because he brings in so much about. Um, our, our, the limits of our knowledge. I mean, he uses that in terms of prices and saying that prices are no, a knowledge mechanism, which is, again, complementary to Mises. But 
in, in a broader philosophical sense, I feel that Hayek um, forces us to check our, how, how, how much we think we understand about the world. And where, you know, so the, where the Rothbardian approach seems to lead you towards a sense that you know how it all can work because you're following a logical path, you know, Hayek's got so rooted in emergent order and in evolution, sort of the evolution of social systems and of knowledge and, and, um, and how unpredictable that is and how vast it is and how humble we must be in the face of that. I, I just think that's, you can't dismiss that. The, the Hayek versus Rothbard is, uh, I, like, I just think that's kind of a, it's a waste of time. You have to read both. You have to appreciate both. It's not one versus the other. They, 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 you know, I think the Rothbard vision might be the best vision of a perfect end game, um, or a perfect sort of uh, ideal. But the Hayekian method, the Hayekian way of thinking, I, I, I think is actually the way to get there, or the better way to get there. Um, and, uh, and so that's sort of my approach on that. I, I try to just read it all and take it all in and find you know, how it meshes with my thinking and how it meshes with my understanding of people and the way the world seems to work and the way people seem to behave and, and, and do my best. And I'm still, I'm still learning. I mean, I, this is all subject to change. Okay, let's see. So next one's up. Two questions. Okay, I'll skip this one. This is about how we made the video. This is the first question. The second question is, what do you make of the feud between the Mises crowd and the GMU slash Reason crowd? Do you see, you seem to cross the boundary and have a good relationship with both, which is true. Uh, I think I heard Rockwell interview you. You're obviously working with Russ. Um... So how do you get all past this? And then blah, 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 blah. so okay. So the the, the real the, juxta, the the core of this question is what do you think of libertarian infighting? And um, I don't think about it, and I don't really care about it. That's really my answer. The you know I haven't been in this community or in this movement, so to speak. Uh, for years and years and years, I, I, I only started to discover these ideas really in 2007, 2008, and um, I've since met a lot of these people. You know, the, the guys at Mises when I went down, when they invited me down to um, talk about Fear the Boom and Bust, and you know, and then Lou, Lou Rockwell had me on his uh, podcast, which was a lot of fun, and I listened to his podcast all the time, and. Um, and of course, I obviously have a tremendous friendship and working relationship with Russ and the guys at Mercatus and um, GMU and all those economists and people. They're all great. I mean, you know, I, why why the energy that gets expended by libertarians in in um, uh, minutia is 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 really pretty silly to me. I just you know, from both sides to the extent that it happens. I just don't care. I just, you know, we've got a, a gigantic, uh, you know, governance crisis. I, I don't use that word lightly because I hate the word crisis, but we, we do have a governance crisis. We have the failure of a, ph ph a philosophy of government happening around us and it's impacting the world. And to have uh, lengthy debates about methodology I mean it's not there's it's not that there's any there's no value in that it's just that if that consumes all your time when you have the capacity to actually communicate these ideas to other people I, that just seems like the opportunity cost of of engaging in that stuff is just too high there's not enough people that understand these ideas to spend to for, for those who do to spend their time bickering about unresolvable nonsense that seems to basically like approach the asymptotic line of of waste um so that's my opinion i don't i, I just don't care um underneath that stuff is this is probably 
all kinds of stuff that's happened 10, 20, 30 years ago that I just don't know anything about or I just don't really care about that much. I, I definitely, anybody that's in, anybody that uh, has put forward ideas that I disagree with, I'm going to disagree with them. And anybody that's um, been, you know, bigoted or hateful or, uh, I, I just reject, I reject that. I reject that approach. I reject that idea. That's repugnant. But, um, the pe most of the people I've met have been really neat people and I've learned from them and, you know, it's, it's not my job to judge everybody that I meet. Um, and that's it. That's my answer. So that's that. Okay. Let me see what, what next, what do you think of the tea party? Well, to the extent that there is a thing called the tea party, it seems like on balance it's probably a good thing because it seems to be rooted in an attempt to limit government at least along some dimensions they don't seem to the groups that are that are labeling themselves tea, the tea party don't seem to focus too much on the kinds of social issues that a lot of conservatives have which while at a personal level, I might even agree with, but on an actual, how does the government get involved level, I just don't just think the government has a role to play. Um, because they don't really have any good roles to play. Um, you know, uh, or there, you know, there's, there, there's what, 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 what is it least bad at is really where I, is the way I look at the government. You know, there's things that it's outright horrible at, and there's what's the things that's like, well, you know, it's somewhat close to what, you know, we obviously, we do need various services and they might be inefficient at providing them and a monopoly is usually a bad idea but anyway I'm, di I'm digressing uh, I, you know I have reservations about the Tea Party but I think by and large it's a good thing um, I, I'm curious to see if it sticks around if like what, what what's the role it's going to play in coming elections for, not about the presidential election I, that's just a uh, a big popularity contest, but the actual, the congressional elections seem like a more interesting place for them to exert influence and, and, and impact the debate. And uh, I hope they get over, to the extent that that a, a large percentage of Tea Partiers like bombing brown people all over the world, I hope they learn that that's really inconsistent with Christian values, and um, to the extent that they want to keep brown people from coming into the country because they're stealing their jobs, so to speak, which is obviously false. Uh, I, I, I really hope they can learn about how people are fundamentally creative and productive, and the more we have, the better we will all be, because production is the source of our prosperity. It's the source of our purchasing power. It's not, there's not a fixed number of jobs. So in things like immigration and foreign policy, where I think the Tea Party as a group, again, big caveats, lots of different things call, it, call themselves a Tea Party. But in those areas, I think they need to be more liberal in the classical sense, although in, that, in those cases, in, in the modern sense too, I mean, we just need to have li more liberal immigration and we need to have a, 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 a more, you know, non-interventionist, non-militaristic, non-aggressive foreign policy, treat other people with respect. Um, okay, next up. I don't have a question. Okay, no, I guess not. I don't see copyright statements nor creative comments statements on the videos or on the Econ Stories website. What's your position on intellectual property? If you're an IP abolitionist, do you feel that this issue needs more attention given this latest attack on freedom from the internet by the government? So, I, um, I'm still learning about this issue. I, I'm inclined to say that intellectual property, so to speak, is not really property. And that, um, we really shouldn't, it's, really, we really shouldn't have, at least we shouldn't have anywhere near the system of patents and copyrights that we have now. But, um, pretty sympathetic to the idea that we shouldn't have any at all. Um, you know, as a creative person, I don't, 
set out to create first and foremost with the hope of maintaining some type of monopoly on what I do. That being said, I do want to get paid for my work, and um, it's hard. You know, it's hard to exactly imagine what what would happen, what would change if there weren't these copyright protections from. And my my first guess is that you'd have technology solutions the way app the way Apple has done. You know, there's nothing wrong with digital rights management. There's nothing wrong with encryption and um, and business models that you know restrict access to content. Um, and that you know being against those things in and of itself just doesn't make any sense to me either. So if you want to you know, deregulate the movie industry so that you so that the movie studios can own theaters and then they can have a, a vertically integrated model where they release their movies to the theaters and they, they maintain much better security up and down the chain through encryption the way Apple does. You know, a- Apple's, um, now given Apple's got its own aggressiveness and it's both offensive and defensive on the patents front but and, and, and copyright and trademark. But it seems like it's more a question of business model than uh, rights or morals and ethics. Um, but there do seem to be areas that are really hard questions, things like pharmaceuticals, where once you discover that a drug does something, reproduction of the compound in a little pill is essentially free. You know, it just anybody can do any, virtually anybody can produce it once the work has been done to find out that it that a certain combination of molecules cures this disease or that or helps this ailment or that ailment um, and I haven't read enough to know what the potential alternatives to a patent system of some kind are um, but it would definitely be a bad thing if we didn't have any more you know medical pharmaceuticals that would be bad. So, I think that that's something to really be not not be didactic about or dogmatic about, but to to think real hard and to look at look at it deeply. And I haven't done that, so I can't really answer in a full way. Um, as for the econ stories work, we 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 produced it with non you know, with donations, and we did it to get the word out about these ideas, so take it, use it, awesome. <laughs> that's our, that's the approach um, at this point. Um, okay. If Keynes ever stays down, which we wish, would he be, cons- would I consider doing a Hayek-Friedman video? So I guess the question really is, would I do a Hayek versus Friedman video? Um, no. I don't think I would. I don't think there's enough difference between Hayek and Friedman for there to be a, a video devoted to that. You know, uh, I've read, um, I haven't read The Monetary History, but I read Money Mischief from Milton Friedman and, and Free to Choose and, and, you know, watched a ton of his stuff online, his interviews and various appearances. Milton's awesome. <laughs> I mean, Milton Milton's is an amazing um, advocate for 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 competition and free markets and liberty. And even his the, the views that a lot of Austrians and especially the more uh, you know hardcore sort of Rothbardian Austrians take against Friedman this anti-Friedman stuff. I just you know like that gets back into weird libertarian infighting that I don't care about. You know, Milton's great. His views on money evolved over time. I think by the time he, uh, you know, was near the end of his life, he was in favor of abolishing the Fed. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the intricacies of the, the, the differences between Friedman and monitor, and that sort of um, monetarist view with regard to money versus Hayek and uh, you know, and then Mises and and then Rothbard's very different in this regard. But they, they're, they're, it's just complicated stuff, and I'm still trying to f- do my best to understand it, given that I'm not a PhD student in monetary theory. Um, and the amount of people who are also not PhD students in monetary theory and have read 
a handful of books, perhaps even fewer than I have on this stuff, that have decided that Milton's just nonsense on money and, you know, only Rothbard's right. I mean, maybe you're right, I, but have a little more skepticism about what you think you know. Um, again, like maybe maybe that maybe Rothbard's approach is correct. I'm, you know, I'm I'm skeptical of certain things like the, you know, attacks on fractional reserve banking, etc., etc., et stuff like that. Um, let's see what else. What is your ideal role for government in society? ID regulatory only military and defense with police, roads, schools. Where should government? be and what shouldn't it be so my my ideal the perfect society has no government at all and that is very consistent to me with logic and with ethics more so than even economics necessarily to me it's an ethic that becomes an ethical question when you like when you talk about the ideal it also is a, a, a spiritual question in a way because you know, if we lived in an ideal world, um, I think like James Madison said, if men were angels, there'd be no need for government. And um, there's no, there's certainly no, if there's a heaven, which I believe there is, I'd like to hope there is, uh, there's no government in heaven, there's no police, there's no um, magistrate. So that's the ideal, and the ideal zero. Um, now, where I'm uncomfortable with making that the core of every argument and the necessary conclusion that I point towards strongly in every discussion I have about the government is that there is a need for governance, there's a need for rules, and people create rules, people create institutions, um, which is just a fancy word for saying sets of rules that everybody that abides by and, and, and signs up for or not. And we see it in things like sports franchises. We see it in the, you know, uh, I've seen this hilarious critique of libertarianism multiple times with regard to, uh, I think it was like the hockey league, like the NHL, and how, look, there was this internal incentive to not wear a helmet because, you, you know, not wearing a helmet while you played hockey gave you an advantage over guys that wore a helmet in terms of your visibility and your flexibility. And then there was also a sort of machismo thing where if you didn't wear a helmet, you were like a tough guy. And so all the incentives on an individual level in hockey is to not wear a helmet, but not wearing a helmet means you get brain damage, and it's a really good idea to wear a helmet when you're playing hockey. And so goes the argument. The players ultimately succumb to a rule that had to apply to all of them, that they all had to wear helmets, and it was essentially it's seceding their own individual rights, so to speak, so that they could all be safe, and it's supposed to be, well, see, and this is like government, except that, um, no, it's not, <laughs> because you don't have to play hockey, and the NHL is a private institution, and if anything, this is just more proof that people find ways to solve problems on their own without it being, A, a monopoly, and B, you know, ultimately relying on men with guns coming and forcing the rules if you really decide you don't want to obey them. So, you know, where this nexus of no government, ideal government, to me, starts to become cloudy in a very real sense is the difference between, you know, is really about the size of organizations and how easy you can leave them. Those are the things that matter. Because I've worked in a big company and I've seen bureaucracy and I've seen the knowledge problem, the Hayekian knowledge problem, where the people at the top don't don't and can't know all the important information that's happening in the organization. And um, then I worked in a company, uh, Viacom, whose total population in terms of employees actually exceeded the town that I that I was living in, which was Verona, New Jersey. So Viacom had like 14,000 employees, and Verona, New Jersey had 13,000 citizens. And we can get into the differences between this, the property rights and, the, and who's right to title and, and the domain over which Viacom's rules apply versus Verona's. But the fact of the matter is, the ability for me to 
choose to leave Verona was pretty similar to the ability to leave my job. If anything, it was actually perhaps a harder decision to leave my job than to move because of, you know, leaving your job if you don't have another job to go to means foregoing an income, which makes other things harder to do. So, whereas moving, you can just sell your house and move. But again, that's not perfect either. So the point is, is that there's this gray zone of governance and, 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 inst and, and, and community and rules and how do we, as, a, as communities, create rules and get people to abide by them and yet not have those rules turn into a kind of tyranny and get captured or get calcified into, you know, anti-liberty anti or, you know, or even violent traditions. And um, that, that's just, a, it's a complex thing. And I think the mistake that a lot of young libertarians that get excited by Rothbard and excited by this notion of anarcho-capitalism make is they get so excited by this great vision that they make it seem as if, well, that's all the argument you need to make. That's the problem to solve, is to convince people that we don't need a government. And I, I just don't, I don't think it's persuasive. I, it, it's a leap too far. It's too giant a paradigm shift to expect people to make um, who, who aren't even anywhere close to thinking that that makes any sense. And there's still, there's the, and there's, the, there's the question, like, can you ever get rid of something called government? I mean, you know, they... Guys with, guys with guns seem to roll on in, uh, you know, and that, that just, that's just, that's history. That, that's what happens. Um, so that's a real reasonable question to be like, since, since when are you going to be able to get rid of anything that you can call a government and then have it not be brought back either by external force or by, you know, sort of internal majorities that decide they want to they want to rule over everybody else. I mean, you know, it's it's a deeper question than than these ideals and philosophy. It becomes the nature of man and it becomes whether you know, there are people who are inclined to want to control others. And there are people who are inclined to want to relinquish control. And that's um that's something we have to contend with. Okay. So, Last couple questions. Um, have you read the collection of Hayek's pr essays, Prices in Production and Other Works by Salerno? Um, it's available on Mises. The comparison Hayek makes between barter slash fixed money supply currency economies and fractional reserve economies is probably one of the most mind-blowing things. Okay, let me. Tr I'm trying to get a sense of what this question ultimately is, because it's sort of a question and 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 a, a bunch of ideas being put forward. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna interpret this question to mean two things. Have you read Prices in Production? Which uh, the answer to that is no. I've not read it directly. What I've read is Roger Garrison's Time and Money, which. Uh, it was told to me it is actually a, a, a better read, an easier, a more um, uh, understandable read than Prices and Production. Some, someday I hope to read it, it's just I haven't been able to do that yet. And, uh, and, and Garrison basically tries to take the model that's implied by Hayek's Prices and Production and, and, and build, it, build it out and compare it to uh, his understanding of the Keynesian framework. Um, but I've read The Use of Knowledge in Society and um, The Pretense of Knowledge, which is the Nobel Prize lecture. I've read The Road to Serfdom. I've read a couple of these other essays from Hayek. And um, I haven't read The Fail Conceit yet, which Russ loves that book, so I'm going to have to read that. But, um, you know, I've also gotten a gist of a lot of the arguments in, in other reading. So that's the reading. That's the Hayek reading for me. Um... I think what the rest of this is basically talking about is the whole f question of fractional reserve banking. 
So I'm just going to take this as, do you think fractional reserve banking is a good idea or not? And um, I think there's two things. One is, the way, the way, my, the way Rothbard talks about fractional reserve banking, and, and, and all fraction, I mean, even, you know, it's like a buzzword, fractional reserve banking, but it's simply banks that lend out their reserves. Um, so individual banks can't create money. You bring $100 to the bank, and, and they, they lend a portion of it, and because it's very, very rare that any more than a, a, hand, you know, a small percentage of people will actually want their money out at any given time, they're able to leverage it. Um, and so they're able to lend out and only maintain a, a fraction of the, of the reserves that have been deposited. Um, on, but on net, there's a money multiplier effect and blah, blah, blah. You can, there's all types of resources to go through that. I don't need to really explain it. Uh, I, I'm pretty persuaded by George Selgin, as opposed to Rothbard, on, on these issues about fractional reserve banking. Um, Rothbard makes Rothbard says that fractional reserve banking is fraud. He 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 actually says it's a lie, and therefore it's not libertarian because fraud is is a lie and it's and it and it's um you know it's a it's a it's a swindle, it's it's immoral, it's unethical, it's unethical. And you can't base a society on lies. Uh, or you can't have a free society where everyone's lying, I guess is maybe a better way to put that. I don't really s understand how he can say that fractional reserve banking is fraud um, because banks make it clear that they're lending the money. I think most people understand that they're lending the money and, uh, and that not all the money's there. So because if everybody thought all the money was there, then they wouldn't run on the banks. The fact that they run on banks sometimes is just a demonstration that they know not all the money's there. So the fraud angle doesn't hold up, and that's really more of an ethical, legal argument than an economic argument, but it seems to be the one that, that um, Rothbard makes pretty strenuously. The economic argument about fractional reserves... Um, which is also another way of just saying banking in general, because if you don't have lending, you're not really a bank in the sense that we think of banks. It, you know, if you when you give your money to somebody who who invests it and you don't have access to it until it matures, that's not a bank. That's investment. That's like giving it to Goldman Sachs or buying a CD. You know, that's not banking as 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 it's been understood. So even that, that's, a, that's also sort of a little bit of an odd thing. Um, but George Selgin and Larry White, have, have, you know, the free bankers, have, I think, demonstrated pretty dis persuasively that history is on the side of people, of, of, of fractional reserve banking emerging, and that that happens naturally in the marketplace, that because of the gains to be made in terms of um, use of savings, that it channels savings into investment um, and is more efficient, which I don't like the term efficient, but that it does make better use of the resources we've got. That, and moreover, um, the way the story gets told about fractional reserves and the money multiplier makes it seem like it's the very beginning of the first instance of, of, of banking ever happening. But once you have a set of banks and a mature banking system of some kind, a set, a set of banks that are all operational, um, the money that you get to deposit into your bank has probably come from another bank. So the increase in the money, in the lend out, the credit-based money, the, you know, the, the, the debt money, so to speak, um, is offset by a decrease in the bank from which you withdrew your money. So the story gets told that, well, you know, you deposit $100 and then 90, and then they lend out 90, and that 90 goes into another bank, and that bank lends out 80, but, you know, in each one of these cases, the people that have deposited think they still have all the money, so you just add it all up. Uh, but that doesn't actually, but, but in, re, in modern reality, 
you put the hundred dollars in the bank, but you took that hundred dollars out of another bank, or you took it, or or it was given to you by way of your employer who might use the same bank. Either way, the total supply of money is not changing. But money supply stuff, in, in the stepping back for a minute, money supply stuff is pretty um, complicated, and. Uh, you know what is money and what 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 should you call money or not? Is a checking account money? You know, isn't you know the the different money supplies M one, M two, M three, M M Z M. You know the the sort of te the, the tenuous relationship between changes in the supply of money and the actual rates of price inflation. Um, I just think it's pretty complicated stuff and. It really gets into that realm of, of where Hayek says we don't really have the knowledge and, and the tools to, to get a grasp of it. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at with it. I, I, I think that the, um, the ideas of, uh, of, of Selgin and White, and even to some extent Scott Sumner who talks about nominal spending, although, you know, again, uh, I'm still working through this stuff. I'm not convinced that there's a surefire argument in 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 here that that's just that's the answer um it's just very complex let's see this will be my last question okay do you agree with harry do you agree with harry brown's libertarian resolutions so i read through these libertarian resolutions let me just bring them up and um, um, very strenuously, for the most part, I agree with them. Some of them are a little interesting, like, uh, you know, tuck your shirt in, <laughs> don't be a slob, basically. You know, it's a little bit of a strange, paternalistic um, uh, resolution. But there's a bunch of these that I think, you know, uh, I myself have spent some energy trying to trying to put forward, and and encourage people that I know to, that that believe in um, libertarian philosophy and 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 uh, libertarian way of looking at how to make the world a better place to do. So, you know, number five, I resolve to be compassionate and respectful of the beliefs and needs that lead people to seek government help. I don't have to approve of their subsidies or policies, but I don't acknowledge that I do. But if I don't acknowledge their needs, I have no hope of helping them find a better way to solve their problems. A better, a nice way of putting this, which is what I like to talk about a lot, is that we have to have empathy for other people. We have to em have empathy not just for their situations, but for the way they understand the world, the the paradigm, if you will, that they're operating in. You know what they see as legitimate and illegitimate, how they frame the way they think. And um, the way I think about it a lot uh, is, is what is communication. And I think a lot of libertarians um, and, peop and, and people that call themselves objectivists and, you know, just, you know are, are tend to be a very, you know, logic, logic oriented people. And um, logic's fine, but logic doesn't win arguments usually. It tends to be emotion, it tends to be heart. So strategically, it, you, if you're not playing in that game, you're going to lose. You're going to lose out, and worse, you're going to lose out to horrible demagogues who are lying to people to make them feel good. Um, so you, you shouldn't di misrepresent your ideas to try to win in arguments, but you need to listen and you need to be a nice guy and you need to um, be understanding of circumstances and you can't be so, so strident, which again, I think sometimes... Um, uh, if you read, if you spend too much time reading Rothbard, and even more reading than watching him, if you watch his interviews, he's much more of a of a charismatic, um, funny, warm-looking person. Then sometimes when you read him, the stridence comes through more, you know, colder. But if you can't communicate your ideas in such a way that other people actually understand the meaning, you're not communicating. So libertarians have a tendency to focus, because of that, that logical bent, on the precision with which they explain the idea in the language they believe to be the correct terms. Nobody cares about that. Um, 
people want to understand the idea, the concept, the point, the, 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 the conclusion. And if you can't get them there because you're not communicating in a way that's, that fits with the way they understand, um, you're failing. You're not communicating. It's like you're speaking literally different languages. So, you know, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. Speak like the Romans speak. And when you're talking to somebody who has wildly different views than you, spend more time listening than talking. Um, and get a sense of where they're coming from first. And then find the ways in which you can um, work through those views and introduce the ideas that you think make more sense to you, but in a way that where they get it and where they're not repulsed or, or, or recoil back and, and they shut their brain off. Because if they do that, it's your fault. You know, it's your fault first. And that's, to me, the biggest point. And, that, you know, so I think most of Harry, Harry Brown's libertarian resolutions are, are good. So check those out on fee.org. Um... Why do you think that so many young people are now just discovering the ideas of Ron Paul and the Austrian school? Is it because of the internet? Um, and how can a high schooler such as myself spread the Austrian message to my peers? Well, I, I do think it's in large part because of the internet that Austrian econ, the Austrian perspective, and the message that Ron Paul has, has been putting out there for a very long time has caught on. I only discovered this stuff in 2007 in the, in the, in the election. Um, and and it, that was when I started to, that's when I saw Ron, what Ron Paul was talking about and it started to click for me. Um, um, so I think the best thing you can do is, like sort of following, going back to this the prior question, learn the ideas, keep an open mind, keep trying to understand them, keep challenging yourself and your, your, uh, your assumptions, and then do the best job you possibly can at um, communicating them with other people in such a way that's empathetic and that 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 re that is built on your understanding of them. And um, and don't be a jerk. Those are the best things you can do. Um, and if you've got creative ways to explain these things, go for it and and try try to make use of what you're good at to do it. That was my whole idea with doing these videos, was that that's what I do for a living. And so I thought this was my comparative advantage in, in, in helping spread the message that there's another way to look at economics and government policy with regard to recessions than government spending creates jobs and, and the Keynesian model. And in fact, the Keynesian model is really pretty problematic and kind of bizarre and rests on ideas that don't hold up to simple simple logic and 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 on the more complex stuff don't hold up to a, a really thorough understanding of the methodology um, so that's what I would do I would I would really dig into the to the to the material and try to have as many conversations with people as you can and in doing that you'll also work out the way you think about things so that's it I uh, I hope uh, I hope this has been helpful <laughs> and thanks for the opportunity to answer your questions and um, by all means feel free to friend me on Facebook I accept all comers and only boot you if you say hateful things so so long as you stay away from that stuff uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all for having you on board um, have a great uh, have a great weekend.